y'all. I'm Angie Thompson, and I am the host of the Fishing Business Podcast. Now, this is a new podcast that I'm hoping to roll out about once a week from here on out, if I can be good and consistent, which I think I can. And I want to tell you a little bit about myself before we get started. Now, don't you hate it when people have real long intros before they start the meat of the show and all you want to do is get to the guest so I totally understand that I just feel like this one time I ought to just say a little bit about myself so if, if you want to fast forward through all of this I don't blame you one bit go ahead but if you're interested I just wanted to let you know that I kind of know what I'm talking about uh, I've been in the fishing industry for almost 30 years I started as a graphic designer uh, and then I went on to become a producer and director at JM Associates which was a production company uh, founded by Jerry McInnes and our only client back then was ESPN. We did all of the outdoor programming for ESPN. In fact, there were other packagers and producers around the country, like somebody that lived in Montana would do a show or Oklahoma, but they would send it to JM in Little Rock and we would put it all together uh, for the network. And so we had a big responsibility there and it taught me a ton. And as I said, I produced several shows there. I hosted a show called Cumberland Stories that used to be on ESPN2 for a while. And I was also uh, one of the hosts of the Sunday Morning Block, ESPN2 Outdoors, which was a block of programming that ran from like, you know, 7 to 11 or something like that. So you might have seen me there if, uh, if you were around back then. But probably most of you watching this weren't. Um, <laughs> and that's okay, because that's who I want to talk to. You know, I've, like I said, I've been in the fishing industry for a long time. Uh, about 10 years ago, I think, uh, Jerry McKinnis was part of an ownership group that bought BASS from ESPN, and then I went to work for BASS. I did a number of things there. I was doing um, business development for a while. I was vice president of uh, sponsorships and events, and my last role there was um, vice president of sales. And uh, I guess I have come to a point in my life because of uh, recent events that has led me to believe that it's time for me to pass on some of the things I know and um, some of the things I've learned over the years. And I think there's a lot of people out there that, that, need, to, that need to hear what, what people like me know. And so I'm hoping you'll enjoy this podcast. Now, you know, you may be uh, aspiring to be a professional angler or you may just be a weekend guy who'd like to figure out a little bit more about the business side of fishing so you might could get some help. Uh, with your fishing habit. And you might just be a person who has stumbled upon this podcast and you're just interested in, in what we have to say. You might uh, be looking for a job or hoping to one day get a job in the outdoor industry. And I think all of that will come to play here. And honestly, even if you're just a personal friend of mine that you're watching this and there's probably more of them that are going to watch it than, than, than the others, uh, I'm hoping that you'll get something out of this because uh, the people I'm going to talk to are all just incredible people with incredibly smart ideas and I think they can just help all of us um, just be better, be better people because they're all good people. So I know that sounds like a tall order to feel, but I feel, it re I feel really, really uh, confident that I can do that. So we're going to take a short break and then we're going to get started with our very first guest, Keith Daffron. Speaking of quality people, Keith is the president of Vexus Boats, which is a brand new boat company and uh, bass boat company. And y'all, they are just making waves. Their boat is unbelievable. And Keith has been around the business for a long time. And he's a lot like me. He has recently um, been through some changes in his life. Uh, he's the grandson of Forrest and Nina Wood, and, who are just icons in the fishing industry. And they taught him a lot. Uh, that he's going to share with us. And I uh, can't wait to get started talking to Keith, and we're going to do that in just a second. So let's just, why don't we start then by you just kind of telling us about your background in the fishing industry, in case anybody out there doesn't know. Yeah, or in case anybody actually cares. <laughs> the, uh, well, my background in the fishing industry starts uh, really as a young boy. You know, growing up in Flippin, Arkansas, it's it's hard to be oblivious to the boat manufacturing that's done here, the lakes and rivers that we've got. And so I grew up as a fisherman, an avid one, uh, mm -hmm. you know, collecting brochures, and Bassmaster magazines, and all those things that you hear about. And so as I got to be uh, you know old enough to work, I just immediately went to work building boats. 
yeah. and with the exception of four years at Arkansas Tech University, which you know I chose that institution because it's on the banks of the Arkansas River, Lake Darnell, right. a place where I could fish regularly, uh, and and did until I came back here and uh, continued to uh, call flipping Arkansas home. Spent a lot of time across the country at different reservoirs and impoundments and areas, but this this has always been home. And you know it's a very unique place. You you know that firsthand that yeah. it's got a really cool culture and heritage, uh, not just with boat building, but with uh, the outdoors in general. Right, right. And do you think, would you say you have always been more on the sales and marketing side of the fishing business or more on the operational and, you know, business side of the business, although all of it's business? Well, the people within the walls and halls of this place, I think, would tell you that I'm certainly more sales oriented, that yeah. that's one of the more fun more gratifying things that I think you can do is to sell a product like we produce to someone because it's a, it's obviously an enthusiast product and something that you don't necessarily have to have. This isn't like selling insurance or automobiles. Right. And so, yeah, I think, I think on the sales and marketing side is probably where I've spent more time and energy, but our most recent endeavor, I've spent a lot more time in the operational manufacturing side and, and find it very gratifying as well. Yeah, you know, there's, that's one thing I think is really cool about our industry. There's a lot of different ways that people can go if they want to make a living in the fishing industry. And there's so many young guys coming up now that are so sharp. And, you know, they maybe, you probably, you know, aspired to work in this industry from a young age. But I think there's a lot of people our age that didn't, that found their way into it. And it was kind of a hard road. But yeah, I think you know, whether you stumbled your way in or worked your way in, once you're in yeah. to our industry, you're always glad that you found it. It's definitely worth aspiring to, in my opinion. I agree. Um, okay, so here's a fun one. What is not on your resume or your LinkedIn profile? What's something that people wouldn't know? <laughs> well, I haven't had a resume uh, maybe ever as I think about it, so I'm not sure uh, how to answer that directly. I think what most people could overlook is the foundation of hard work that was trained into me through my ranching and livestock experience as a young boy. Oh, uh, yeah. I think that, you know, if you grow up, uh, that's one thing that is unfortunate, I believe, in the world today is that it takes less people to farm and ranch. And because of that, less people get the exposure that I think breeds a good work ethic right. in, into them. And so, you know, that's probably something you wouldn't read on the front page of a resume, but as an employer, you'll certainly appreciate it. That's right. And you're right. I mean, there's no doubt that working on a farm will teach you a work ethic, right? Yeah, that's, yeah you really didn't have a choice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. especially for if you work for your grandfather. <laughs> that's especially <laughs> true. So, okay, now let's move on. You, you've started, you founded Vexus Boats. So it's almost, I feel like it's became an overnight icon. I mean, it's already got such an incredible reputation and so many people understand what that boat brand is about just by who's involved with it. But branding is still a big part of it, right? And uh, yeah. you guys are building an iconic brand. Uh, so I know you wear a lot of hats around the, around the boat plant, but what does a typical day look like for you? Oh, well, I, I think my day would be anything but typical. But we, we, we're an early rising, starting, we, we work hard here. We, we have a lot of fun, but you know, my day generally runs six to six within the walls of this place. And it could be anything from meeting and greeting customers and helping them take delivery of a boat to troubleshooting uh, you know, things on the plant floor. I spend a lot of time in the facility mm -hmm. as opposed to in this office, which I find very enjoyable. But you know, the more gratifying part of it is dealing with all the people, whether it's our team internally, okay or whether it's the uh, dealer and customer relations that we forge along the way. You know, just today, there's been a number of prospective or existing customers here to, to visit the place and to take a tour. And, and that's, that's really fun when you get to show off our facility and our team and how we do it differently. Yeah, and you guys are, you're the best in the world at that. I really feel like knowing you guys like I do, you're, you're so good at hospitality and understanding uh, you know, what that means and what customer relationships mean. And really, in general, just what relationships mean. Don't well, you I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, that's, it's kind of you to say, I think of it a little bit this way, Angie, that, that it, it really dates back. We talk a lot internally about Forrest and Nina Wood's foundational philosophies. And, and I think it dates back to their days of operating a guide service on the White River. 
where yeah. where that uh, where where it, really the basis of what you were doing was building relationships and, and entertaining and accommodating. Right. And that spilled over into the boat building aspect of it. And I think does within the walls of, uh, or underneath our brand that Vexus is to, is to really be as accommodating and mean it. You know, I think you, you hear it said a lot that you can say you care, but you've got to really mean it for it to matter. And, yeah. and I think that's the part I want our team to always understand that you really do have to mean it. Yeah, and I, like I said, I think that's the most, in my opinion, the most successful businesses and the ones that we want to, that we really look forward to doing business with are built on those kinds of relationships. I agree, very much so. Okay, so what is it, we'll go back to the brand building, you're, you're building a, an iconic brand, it's kind of, like I said, is already iconic. Um, oh, well, thanks. But, but what sets the Vexus brand apart from other boat brands? Well, it, it's, uh, that's, it's hard to answer. It's a mouthful to answer that question. I, I think what, what I believe sets the Vexus brand apart, it begins with our people, the team, the, the, the experienced team that we have, uh, not just producing or designing a product, but also selling and marketing. It, it encompasses all of that. But to the end the consumer, the angler, the person yeah. that's out in the boat, it's going to be the product. It's going to be the innovation that's instilled into the product. Where we're, we're, we're working very hard to leave no shadow of doubt as to who builds the best fishing boat. Right. And, and I think that's the, the biggest part of building the brand. Right. That's right. I always think of, um, not, I don't know if you would, you know how you, you think of luxury cars, right? And I think of, mm -hmm. maybe I'm wrong, but I kind of think of Vexus as being the luxury line of bass boats. I think that's right. I think it's in the you know European sports car. You could paint that picture to luxury sedan. Right. Uh, it, it actually has both characteristics, you know, from a look and a feel and a performance. And uh, you know, but if you if you just went if, to use an analogy in a completely separate industry, think of fast food. You know, fast food. There's nothing really unique about that. Uh, but but now look at Chick Fil A, and right. and and the approach that they've taken. To, to what I would call traditional fast food and how that's worked for them. You know, it's the, it's the foundation of their company that they have built this empire upon. And, and that's not necessarily what success looks like for us, but I think to have that same separation uh, as it relates to our competitors, that would be something that we could take a lot of pride in, is for people to look at that and, and, and know that our behavior is very similar. Yeah, I love that. I love how you understand that. So, you know, I'm hoping that the people that are listening to this are trying to understand more about the business of fishing. And of course, a lot of that uh, um, has to do with marketing, uh, especially mm -hmm. for people like me and you. But what do you think the importance of building your brand is, whether you're building a boat brand or building a personal brand? Well, I, I think it's, it's a, really about the most critical thing that you're doing is, you know, I, I joke within, you know, certain meetings that we have here, especially early on, that uh, you have to go back to what, we throw the, the name or the word brand around a lot now, especially in the marketing arena. Everybody wants to talk about brand. Well, you go back to what it really meant. It was a livestock marking, you know, back in the 1800s uh -huh, and yeah. it signified something. So, he, you know, if you were- the, I have never put that together. I have yeah, never put that together. Yeah. So when Mr. King from Texas ran his cattle to the rail yard, it didn't take long for them to understand that Mr. King's cattle were worth more because of the brand that, that they carried. And if you, if you just fast forward from the 1800s until today, the same holds true. We've just got much different media forms and ways of explaining it, but the mark still is important. And, and so that, that to me is, is, is so critical to what we're doing and every, every decision that's made, every, uh, every, you know, obstacle that you overcome is, is in, accordance to building the brand to to what the consumer sees it as a face uh, and, right. and that's that's the way you have to approach it in my opinion but it's not it's more than a graphic you know a lot of times i'll oh, hear yeah. or say to me you know uh i'll say what well, you know we need to work on your brand and they'll say well i don't have a logo it's not right. it's not a graphic it's not a logo no 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 no. it's uh to me it, it it's it, it's not even the artistic side of it it's the conceptual side um, that you look, 
actually mean something. Some of it could be involuntary, uh, you know, that you translate what you think a brand means. And you ask about like an individual brand as an angler. And, and to me, it's probably even more important, but it's unique in the fact that they really, that angler controls everything around the brand. Where in my case, it's, it's everybody, everybody that's associated is in some way uh, uh, either building the brand or, or not building it, whatever right, right. the case might be. Yeah, so you have a lot more variables. That's right. Yeah, more, more things could go good or bad depending on the influence, if that makes sense. Right. You know, right. it's, and some of it is out of your direct control, but if you do the things right that you should do, I think the behavior transcends all the way through the, you know, you know, the product. That's right. That's right. Okay. So do you consider, well, I already asked you that question about that. Um, okay. Here's a great one that I can't wait to hear what you say. How important <laughs> is storytelling in building your brand? Well, in our case, it was, it was vital because without the ability to tell our story, we're just a new fishing boat company that, people don't even understand why there would need to be one because there's great fishing boats out there. We all understand that. But with our story, I think people are able to relate to the situation and to the overall strategy uh, much easier. And that's, and that's especially true today in the digital world. I mean, we're sitting here in a podcast, we're able to create uh, awareness for our brand so much faster than you could ever dream to have done it. 15, 20 years ago. That's right. And you have a lot of opportunities to tell, um, you know, and, and I think this is really important is you have a lot of opportunities to tell small stories that really tell a big story. Yeah. Like a, you take, for instance, a, a good, for instance, actually is what we call our heart and soul section. If you go to our website, there's, there's a series of videos and there we've, we've been introducing them every Friday. Uh, one dropped just a few hours ago, and and they're little vignettes, if you would, of just different angles of the of of our company and our people and our culture and our philosophies, and and I think that's important to people that want to buy a fishing boat like this mm -hmm. is to understand why you would choose Vexus over an array of others, and and I think we do have a different story to tell, and and when we're able to do that, it works that way. And that lesson goes right through to every bit of marketing. Whether, like I said, whether yeah. you're talking about Nike or whether you're talking about Vexus or whether you're talking about Angie Thompson's brand, it's the same for all of us. Yeah, in my 20 plus years of doing this, I've watched the sales and marketing buckets. You know, there used to be a dotted line between them. And then that dotted line got coarser, more defined. And now, in my personal opinion, they're together. They're, yeah. they're one in the same in the world That's that right. we live in. You have to treat sales and marketing as one particular part of your organization. Right. But I also say, you know, you, you also, an angler or anybody that's getting an endorsement needs to also be careful that they're not um, too salesy all the time. Of course. Like stay in yeah. your social media, right? I mean, you guys aren't too salesy, and, but, a, but an individual even has to really worry about, be concerned about that too. Nobody wants to be sold to all the time. No, in fact, I think it's a hindrance to even try. Uh, I think you provide the information as, as fluidly as you possibly can. Certainly respond to inquiries and questions as quickly and as accurately as possible. But the used car, uh, you know, feel, uh, that, that doesn't fit in today's world at all. It just doesn't. You see right through it. They do. The world just, it, and to me, I think the world that we live in, you know, whether it's the Amazons of the world or the boutiques of the world, you're seeing a separation uh, where, where we make decisions to buy digitally, where we'd rather not speak to anyone for any reason. I mean, not, you know, look at Walmart's grocery pickup as an example where people don't even want to go in the store to, to have to bother with that. And, and then there's the boutique. The boutique where you know the lady that owns the place or she's friends of a friend and you've got the utmost personable experience possible to buy clothing. Mm -hmm. And and to me, that's for our company. We're a little bit of both. We provide a lot of the digital, you know, kind of figure it all out without our help if you want to, or if you want us to stand there, you know, alongside you at the counter all the way through the process, we'll do it. 
Yeah, and I love that about y'all because you know what it says to me is y'all are a, a big company with a little company mentality. And and I Thank think you're a big company, but, but I know what you're saying. Point, but, yeah. <laughs> but I know you don't consider yourself a big company, but I mean, my gosh, y'all are y'all are a very, very important piece of the puzzle of fishing, you know, the fishing industry. But you but you when you go in the plant, you feel like you're uh, walking into someone's home. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, I, to me, I look at it this way, Angie, that in every segment of the outdoors, every single segment that I'm familiar with, somebody is the undisputed leader in quality That's of right. every one of those segments. All right. And I won't name the names because it, it's not relevant because it's you as a customer, you're supposed to define that. But in the world of fishing boats, that that is our goal is for when I ask that question, who's the undisputed quality leader? innovation leader in the world of fishing boats, we want the answer to be Vexus and we won't rest until that happens. Okay. And now, you know, I didn't ask who was the biggest. I didn't ask who was the cheapest. I didn't even ask who the most expensive was, ask who the best was. And, and if you look, there's always room at the top in every segment of our industry for that. Yeah. I love that. I love that about y'all. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, what, oh, this is a great one. What do you see young and there's a lot of young and up and coming anglers out there in the tournament world. What do you see them doing right? The, a couple come to mind. The, the ones I see doing it right are using their humility to their advantage. Okay. And it, it reminds me, Forrest did this. Jerry did this. Uh, yeah. Guys that kind of early on, they just never outgrew their humble nature. And, uh, you know, I think in one of your questions, you asked who was an up and comer. I'm thinking of Cody Huff, for example, this oh, kid yeah, that lives right. on the north side of the lake from here. You know, I've competed with him or against him at a number of events. And there's no question about the kid's talent. He, he's got the ability to compete in the, you know, with anybody out there, but he's doing it in a way that's, that is, is very humble. And I, and I appreciate that. I think the world can use more of that and, and it, some of that's taught, but it, it, the, the good Lord gives you a good bit of it as well. Well, I can see why you would respect that quality of being humble because it's in your DNA. Oh, well, it, I just think that our industry never has been arrogant anyway, and it doesn't, it doesn't bode well. We're, we, we, we build fishing boats. We go try to fool little green fish and yeah. we spend a lot of energy and money doing that. And so we shouldn't, we shouldn't measure it inappropriately. Yeah, that's right. But your grandfather was Forrest Wood and, and he was one of the most successful. He really is, in my opinion, responsible for this industry and, and was one of the most humble people anyone could ever meet. I'm about to cry. Sorry. <laughs> well, I am too. It's uh, it, I agree with everything you said. Uh, you know, we're, we're about to embark upon the 50th classic without a Jerry McInnes or a Forrest Wood. And you know, something I didn't dream would be possible two months ago or three months yeah. ago or even two weeks ago, hardly. And, yeah. and you know, I think I, I've said this quite a bit lately, you know, just the outreach from people, the, the stories. Everybody's got stories, you know, that they want to share. And that's just so, it helps so much. But to me, I think as an industry, it's time for us to, you know, dig our feet in solid and say, wait just a minute, we've got a responsibility. That's right. uh, those men are irreplaceable. There's no question about that. But their philosophies can be duplicated. And, and we have an obligation to do that as an industry. I'm not talking about Vexus Boats right now. I'm not even talking about Keith Daffron. I'm talking about as an industry, I think that's going to be very critical for us because people want to be a part of our sport. You watch the college fishing, the high school fishing, you know, just the, just the, the, the momentum that we have. But guys like we were talking about right now, we're always up there at the forefront, making sure the industry kept steering itself in the right direction. Yeah, and, and to me, that, that's, that's something that is very precious and hard to obtain and easily lost. And, yeah, I, and I think we've got an obligation to stay focused on it. I'm really glad you brought that up because I know from, from being in so many meetings with Jerry over the years, 
you know, he had a very high sense of what was right and what was wrong. And he yeah. just flat out wouldn't do things that he thought was wrong. And it didn't mm -hmm. matter that how much, uh, how many zeros were attached to it or how many dollar signs were attached to it. He really believed in right and wrong. And I know Forrest did too, yes. and I know you do too. And, uh, and I think most people in our industry do, but you're totally right. I used to say all the time at JM Associates, you know, we had such an incredibly tight little team of very, very talented people that we all kind of grew up together. But I always kept saying, you know, we, we owe it to the, our business and to the industry to teach other people how to do this, not just take it with us as we get old and retire, but to teach other people how to do it. Yes. No, I couldn't agree more. And, and we see that here, you know, in the world of boat building, uh, you know, that's one of the more gratifying things that we're doing is I'm watching the, you know, I'm now the older guy in the, you know, in the area when, when we're talking about, you know, this, this part of the boat that we're building or whatever, right. I'm watching these younger guys get a hold and get, you know, getting the, the, the feel that I remember getting when I was in my twenties. Right. And, and I think that's, that's, you see it with anglers. You know, yeah. that are that are getting bit by the bug of the industry. And I think that's part of what the strategy is here is to to help them understand how to find their way through this thing. And I think what you just said pretty well sums it up is there's there's really there's no decision to be made when you understand the difference between right and wrong. Just follow the right bucket regardless and, and never steer yourself toward the wrong. Boy, isn't that the truth? That's true throughout, like you said, throughout all business. Um, so, okay, so what is your advice for a brand new angler who doesn't understand how the business of fishing works? There's a lot of guys out there like that, Keith. I think we take it for granted sometimes. There are. That we understand the cycle of when people make decisions and how they make decisions. So, uh, and if you don't, you know, if you don't know the business, you're, you're just out of college or, or you've worked another job for five or six years and now you really feel like you're ready to make the jump to start being a professional angler, you know, what is your best advice for that guy? Well, I think it depends on what the overall goal or objective is of this particular person. Uh, you know, it, oftentimes it goes towards the, you know, the aspiring angler to be uh, a professional angler. And I think the answer to that question is different than somebody that's aspiring to be in the industry uh, with a career of yeah. sorts. And I'll speak to the one, the career, because there's plenty of other guys that are professional anglers that will probably have a better understanding of how to grease the skids to that. Because I've joked a lot that catching the fish is the easy part of what you're doing as a professional angler. It really is. But when you talk about our careers, you know, I'm, I, I think like our head of sales is a ex, ex college angler that won the world championship when he was in college, still a, a, still a great angler, but he's immersed in our industry now. And those stories I just love so much. And there's countless ones out there. And I think it, it goes back to what we talked about earlier on in this podcast. And that's the developing a work ethic that will allow you to get to where your end goal is. Uh, and, and I think you, you can't stress that enough. I tell people as, as we do career orientation tours and things here, that there's very few skill sets within the walls of Bexus boats that we can't teach you, you know, whether that's how to paint or how to, how to assemble a boat or do certain things. But what we have a hard time teaching is effort because you've either learned that or you haven't learned that up, you know, that's right. as you as you mature as a person or an individual and and to me that's you know it's to be be there every day and to be on time and to, and to come ready to learn and to do things and the world will find a way to reward you if you'll do that and and I think that's especially true within our industry is everybody's got different characteristics or skill sets uh, you know to a degree different personalities but but this industry is a lot of fun to work in yeah it, it really a lot of fun to work in because it's full of wonderful people. I call it a cottage industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it is to a degree um, where a lot of Wall Street books don't apply. And, and to me, that's one of the more fun things about it because it, it, the, you know, these, the, the big corporate feel hasn't proven to work very well um, because we're still in a, a, an entertainment. It, it, it's, we're entertaining ourselves through angling. And, and the sooner you wrap your head around that, then the better you're going to be within the industry. You can't just turn it on eight to five, Monday through Friday, and then turn it back off till Monday. The, the industry won't let you do that. Okay. Do you mind if I tell you a quick, 
Forrest story that I know you've heard a million no. times, but um, my, one of my favorite things that Forrest would say, and I tell people this all the time, and it never fails to everybody. It's a knee slapper every time. When I used to, when I, a couple of times when I would say, or I guess it was probably only one time when I would say, Forrest, how many people work here? You know what you'd say? <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. about, half, about half of them. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, that's, which really that's wasn't a, true, which really wasn't true. That's yeah, true. that's right. And, and it was in Forrest's classic way, you know, he would follow that up with, but those that are working are, are the ones making a difference, you that's know, that are truly right. separating us from everybody else. And yeah, I find myself, you know, Forrest isms uh, take a, their new meaning for me today. You know, we used them a lot while he was here, but now that he's gone, it's like, it really resonates, I think, with myself and others when we reflect on his Churchill-like ability to just explain things very simply. You know, that was one thing about Forrest and Jerry that um, was just remarkable to me, and I don't know if it's their generation, and I don't know if, if, if that'll if other people, if other people will have these qualities, but they were, you know, like Jerry didn't go to college. Um, mm. he, he knew he, he, his business acumen came from working, you know, mm. and, and just using common sense. And, um, and that, like you said, that work ethic, my gosh, you know, I think about, you know, Jerry, his, his, his answer to everything was work a little bit harder. You know, yeah. I mean, that's what he'd tell me now. If I said, I'm sad that you're gone, he'd say, well, you need to uh -huh. work a little bit harder and, and you'll get over that. <laughs> he would say that. And, <laughs> and you know what? I think he'd be right. And, and I also predict that it, you know, what I see in the, in the world today, I think it'll get you farther today than it did as they were coming up through. Yeah. I exactly. really do. I, I think everybody you know, had that mentality. That's right. Coming early and staying late isn't as popular as it used to be. Therefore, it will be more successful than it used to be. Oh, I love that. That's a, that's a gem. Okay, I'm going to take a break right here, and then we'll be right back. Okay, now, Keith, you know I don't really have any commercials. <laughs> but I'm, <laughs> I'm going to put something in here. Um, <laughs> We're going to... Yeah, I'll, I'll put a Vexus. I'll get Sneed to send me a Vexus. There you go. We'll be okay. your first <laughs> advertiser. <laughs> All right. So before we get out of here, though, I did want to ask you, uh, who is, UL, you have talked a little bit about Cody Huff uh, being an up and coming mm -hmm. angler that you're impressed by. Anybody else you can think of that, that that's coming along that, that you that you like? You like well, he was a, he was just the first one that popped into my head when I yeah. read the list of questions. Um, there's a, there's a lot of them. There, there really are. And, and to me, I think some of them are, you know, the national presence isn't as strong as their regional presence is. You know, I looked at, you know, take that tournament on Rayburn last weekend where them boys weighed 49 and a half pound or whatever it was. You know, I, I know Danny just a little bit. Those guys have got something special. And, and to me, the, I love those regional stories as much as I do the national ones where where they've got a, you know, a day job, if you would, and just continue to perform and do well on the weekends. And, and it works pretty well for them when they do that. Well, and you know what, Keith? I, I mean, I tell guys all the time I, that ask me for advice about, you know, how to find sponsors. I'm always like, if you're doing well regionally, find sponsors regionally. You know, mm -hmm. it's no different than, than, than how you grow your fishing career, you know, your fishing, your, comp your competitive side of your business, grow the, you know, the business side of your business in the same way. Start local and then, yeah. then grow from there. That's right. And I think to a degree, sponsorship works a little bit like your business career and the fact that sometimes it's better to be a little underpaid than overpaid because you can prove your worth while you're underpaid. But if you're overpaid, somebody's going to figure that out sooner rather than later and you're going to be looking for the next gig that's great i love that and that's very true i hadn't thought about that okay what's one habit in business or in life in your personal life that you would um recommend a beginner in the fishing business uh take on oh i think the i've touched on it already but maybe it's just maybe it's just the world that i live in but but being responsible enough to always always be there and be on time and be prepared. Gotcha. You know, in the, in the, in the world we live in today, it's easy to be distracted. And right. you know, we were, we pride ourselves here on starting meetings on time, leaving for trips on time, you know, just mm -hmm. being punctual, being yeah. punctual uh, is a habit. And, and I think it breeds more productivity if you do it that way. 
You know what I love about that? You're so right in the, in, when you're talking about, you know, in the concrete world of meetings and trips and that, but it's also true in uh, social media. You should yes. show up in social media consistently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, so That's that right. Fans you know, have that you schedule. Have that you schedule. said you were going to do. Yeah, you almost have to, let's just say you're an angler, an aspiring angler working to develop a social media presence. I think, you know, you have to be as disciplined in what you report and discuss and, and post as you would a fitness routine, Absolutely. you know, that you're following. I, I think it, it, because there's life does get in the way and you can't allow it to, not if you're going right. to be successful. That's right. You got to get help if you need it or, you know, take an hour out of your video game time or, That's right. <laughs> or whatever yeah. it is. You yeah, or stop, stop making those casts on the water for just the 90 seconds it takes to, to, right. to say cool. something meaningful. Okay, uh, and would that also be your best business advice you'd give anybody? Oh, yeah, I think it, we've pretty well touched on yeah. it. I, I go back to the, you know, to our forefathers, if you would, with Forrest and Jerry, and, and, and I think what they, what they have taught us still works today. And as I mentioned earlier, I think it might actually work better because it's more rare than ever before. Uh, show up early and stay late. Yeah, and, and be good to people. You know, I like to, I joke that you got all these fancy mission statements in the world, and I'm sure we'll end up having to have one someday, but mine has been since day one, since the first spade went in the ground, is to build the best product and to be good to people. And, and I think if you'll do those two things, the rest of it finds a way of working itself out. That's awesome, Keith. Thank you so much. Really, that was very, very. Oh, I appreciate you having me very much. And you are, you know, you're such an inspiration to me and and to so many other people. And um, and I mean that. I really do. You're, well, thank a, you're you. a very uh, inspiring person. Sorry, I'm so <laughs> emotional. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've had my share of emotions in the last month too. I had coffee with Nina this morning. I'll I'll share a quick story with you. So the. Her great grandchildren are in the regional tournament tonight oh. in a little, little town of Eureka Springs, west of here, about an hour and a half. And so, one of my aunts uh, is planning to take her over there, which they did two nights ago. And so, I asked Nina, I said, How did the trip go? And she said, Oh, it went a lot better than the last trip I remember to Eureka Springs. And I said, Really? When was that? She said, It was the summer of 1945. I was 13 years old. I rode in the bed of a pickup to Wetumpka, Oklahoma. And you had to buy the fuel was rationed because of the war, and they had their truck had vapor locked in uh, Eureka Springs, and they'd spent a hot summer afternoon waiting until they could get their truck running again. And oh that just gosh. put it in perspective yeah, to me that yeah. yeah, think about that. You know, that's what a life they've lived. Right. That's right. <laughs> Thanks again, Keith. I appreciate it. Thank you, Angie. Okay. Right. Take care. There you go, Keith Daffron. Man, what a guy he is. Listen, when, when Keith Daffron talks, you ought to listen because uh, he's a smart guy and he's got a lot to say. Hopefully, he'll say more through the Fishing Business Podcast here with us. Like I said, I'm going to try to do this about once a week. Y'all, I don't know if I can do that. That's a lot, but I'm going to try because I'm going to do, just like we said there, I'm going to try to show up, okay? And I would love to hear what you guys think. Uh, leave me a review. Leave me a comment here or at Instagram, Fishing Business Podcast, Facebook, Fishing Business Podcast. Uh, I'll be glad to talk to you about anything. Let me know what you want to hear more of. Uh, let me know if you think there's a guest I ought to have on. Uh, let me know if there's a subject you think I ought to cover. Uh, I'm, here, I'm here for you. Uh, now, what I'm not going to do is talk about how to skip a dock or, you know, how to make your um, spinnerbaits run straight because um, <laughs> I think there's enough of that out there. But I'm just going to concentrate on the business of fishing. And um, like I said, there's a lot to cover. There's a lot of ground to cover there. And, and, it, and it goes beyond just business. Like I said, it goes, it, it, it's also just about, you know, how to be a good person. And uh, hopefully you'll find some inspiration and some value in this. Um, now, before I go, I want to wrap up by saying, uh, you know, Keith's grandfather was Forrest Wood. We lost Forrest at the end of January. Uh, it was a devastating loss to the fishing community and, uh, and a huge, huge loss to the people that loved him. And, uh, and I was one of those people. And, uh, but he left, man, he left such a great legacy and so many, he made so many good humans that are running around Marion County, Arkansas right now and other places. Uh, there was a Forrest Wood uh, quote 
that I'd like to leave you with. Uh, he said, it's good to live in a place where you can have a dream and have a chance to achieve it. And uh, that's what I can, I hope I can help you with. And then I'm going to also leave you with a quote from Jerry McInnes. Um, not a quote, but something Jerry used to say. And that is, I want to thank my dad because he always had time to take me through. See you next time. Bye, y'all.